So this is a very simple family of queries that assumes everyone's data is just a real number. And you want to estimate for every threshold tau, what is the fraction of people um, whose number is smaller than tau. And it's equivalent to the computing the CDF of the distribution. And so the question we want to know is, is there some way to incorporate some kind of background knowledge to help overcome the limitations of dealing with large domains? And for today's talk, the kind of background knowledge we explore is having access to a small number of public samples from the same distribution. And what I mean by public samples is that we're allowed to output a function of both the private samples and the public samples, but we can use the public samples any way we want. We don't have to respect their privacy. And these could come, for example, from a set of users who maybe agreed to test your product and opted in to being a public, um, having their data be made public, or perhaps um, data that's already been breached in the past. We're sort of agnostic on where it comes from, but there are lots of settings where we think it's reasonable to assume you have access to some public samples from the same distribution or a similar distribution. So let me describe at a very high level what our results are. So for this example I brought up of threshold queries or computing the CDF, what we show is that if you're given um, enough private samples where enough is about one over alpha squared and just a small fraction of public samples, so just one over alpha public samples, so only a small fraction of your total data is public, then you can privately release threshold queries over an infinite domain. So just to compare this to what I've said so far, if your data is private, if all of your samples are private, if you have no public samples, this problem can't be solved with any finite number of samples. On the other hand, if you had one over alpha squared public samples, then you could solve this problem without using any private data. And what we show is that if about square root of your total number of samples are public, that's as good as having them all be public. Okay, except when epsilon is really small. So I'm sweeping a little bit under the rug, but that's kind of the message of this result I want you to take home is that if even a small fraction of your data is public, then it's as good as having all the data be public. Okay, we also have a much more general theorem that applies for arbitrary classes of linear queries. It has a somewhat more complicated uh, statement, but the way I want to sort of help interpret this theorem to make it um, make it clear is that for any class of queries with bounded VC dimension, um, there is a private algorithm that uses um, only a small fraction of public samples in order to come up with private answers to these queries. So the number of private samples we need is a little complicated. And it depends on a quantity that doesn't really come up elsewhere in privacy called the dual VC dimension. And um, that quantity can be somewhat loosely related to the VC dimension, which does come up uh, in other results on privacy, um, but the relationship is quite loose. But again, the way I'd like to sort of interpret this result is that we have a class of problems where if you had only private data, you might potentially need an infinite number of samples to solve the problem. Uh, if all your samples were public, then kind of standard results in learning theory say that you need about VC dimension over alpha squared samples. And we show that if only a small fraction of your data is made public, it's as good as having all of the data made public. So having some of a small fraction of your data be public uh, enables you to make very effective use of the remaining data, which is still private. Okay, and lastly, we also have a negative result for um, one particular class of queries. And the negative result, again, is maybe a little tricky to state in a short talk like this in a formal way, but what we do is we consider a special class of queries called one-way marginals. It's a very simple class of queries where you imagine that your data consists of K binary features. And for every feature, you have one query which just asks you what proportion of individuals um, have a plus one for that feature. Okay, so there's just k attributes. And I ask you for every individual, what fraction of the individuals have that particular attribute? 
And for this problem, what we show is that um, in order to solve this problem privately, or sorry, in order to solve this problem, you either need to have one over alpha squared public samples or square root k over alpha epsilon private samples. So what's the significance of that bound? Well, if you have one over alpha squared public samples or square root of k over alpha epsilon private samples, then either of those independently would be enough to solve this problem. So what a result shows is that basically in order to solve this problem privately, you either need enough, you, you need enough public samples that, or sorry, in order to solve this problem privately, enough of your samples have to be public that the public samples alone are enough to solve the problem. Okay, and so this is uh, one application where public data actually doesn't help. And one consequence of this result is it shows that this dependence on the dual VC dimension is necessary. So I've been just talking about results. Let me just quickly go over this example of threshold queries and how the algorithm works to give you a sense of how public data can help. So I'm gonna talk about threshold queries over the reals. And this is equivalent to just estimating the cumulative distribution function of the distribution. So imagine you have some distribution and this red line is the CDF, the cumulative distribution function. Well, the first fact to know is that if you draw about one over alpha squared private samples, then the CDF of the data will approximate the CDF of the population. So we can just focus on approximating this blue CDF of the data that we have. Okay, but sorry, but unfortunately, since this is an infinite domain, we actually can't privately approximate this blue CDF using only these private samples. So let's suppose that we chop the real line up into alpha quantiles. So the leftmost uh, interval represents the first alpha quantile, the next one is the two alpha quantile, the next one is the three alpha quantile, and so on and so forth. And suppose we had one representative point from each alpha quantile. These are the orange points that I drew. And then we took all of our blue points and we snapped them to the nearest representative. Then this gives us a new CDF, which is the one I drew in orange. And this CDF is a good approximation to the CDF we want, which is the blue CDF. And moreover, the domain for this orange CDF is only one over alpha different points. It's only supported on the orange points. So now we can just focus on approximating this orange CDF. And this orange CDF, since it has a small domain of size one over alpha, we can use uh, well-known differentially private algorithms like the binary tree mechanism to approximate this orange CDF because it's now over a small domain. And those algorithms only require a number of samples that grows polylogarithmically in the domain size, which in this case is polylogarithmic in one over alpha. So we can use some differentially private algorithm to get an approximation to the orange CDF, which is what I drew in purple. And this would be the final CDF that we output, this purple CDF. And since all of these steps gave me some approximation up to some error about alpha, the purple CDF and the red CDF will be within uh, three or four, five alpha. I wasn't quite keeping track. And of course, this isn't drawn to scale. The purple and red CDFs don't look too close, but that's just because there's limitations to how well I can draw this. So the thing, of course, I haven't told you is where the orange points come from, but maybe it's not surprising given how the talk has been going that these orange points can be used, can be the public samples. So the important fact is that if I draw just a little more than one over alpha samples from the distribution that are public, then I will have at least one orange point inside every alpha quantile. So I can prove that by what's called a coupon collector argument. I may have more orange points inside some quantile. I might have more than one, but that doesn't matter. That actually only helps. It will make um, the discretization a little bit finer. So I'm going to use my public samples to generate a domain over which I can compute a CDF using the private samples. 
And the important fact is that the orange, there's few enough orange points that they won't give me a good approximation to the red CDF, but they give me a rich enough domain to approximate the red CDF. So I'm short on time, but our general result uses a similar idea. We use the public data to find a rich enough domain that's still finite in order to approximate the queries. And then we just use more sophisticated uh, mechanisms for releasing statistical queries over a finite domain. Our lower bound is based on um, a fairly simple observation about the existing lower bounds for one-way marginals that come from work of mine with um, Mark Bunn and Salil Vadan. Uh, but I don't quite have time to get into that. And the thought I want to leave you with is that what our results show is that you can use a small amount of public data to enable more effective use of your private data. And um, I think it's interesting to explore, in addition to what else you can do with public data, um, other types of background knowledge that we can incorporate to overcome the challenges of private data release and how to do so. So I will leave you right there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Dom. This is great. Um, um, and they feel very practical given kind of like a lot of the other talks that we saw given this morning. Um, so for those of you that have questions, you can either type, type them in the chat um, or you can just like unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure. I'm going to stop screen sharing in case um, Judy wants to like take over, get ready. Yeah. Uh, Actually, Mark, Mark is next. Uh, wait, can I unmute Salil? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think I'm unmuted. You're unmuted. Go for it. Yeah, re uh, really interesting, John. Um, the, can you say a little bit about the dual VC dimension and how it comes in? Yeah. So um, basically, what we do is we use the public we, we use the public data to find some domain and. What we use is basically the fact that if you um, if you kind of sample public data and then you look at sort of all of the, you sample the public data, then you use the VC dimension to argue that with respect to that public data, there's not too many different queries uh, or the queries can't assign too many different labelings to the public data. And then the dual VC dimension says that that small set of queries um, there can't be too many kind of distinct universe elements with respect to that small set of queries. I see. And that's the domain we use. So we don't just use. Oh, the that's that, data that's the kind of thing you're round to. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, did that? Sorry, did I miss the last thing you said? Oh, sorry. No, sorry for interrupting. So you were saying that's the domain you use, meaning like th those are the sorts of the the analog of what you round to. Yeah, exactly. So we don't just, unlike the threshold algorithm, the public domain is not the district, is not what we use. Uh, the public data is not what we use as the final domain. We use something derived from the queries and the public data. Maybe. And that, that size ends up having to do with the dual VC. Um, and like uh, Peter, Peter Weiner has a question basically asking where do these public points come from? Do you force some people to release data publicly. Where do you get the that that data? Can you use can you use synthetic points too? Um, yeah, it's a good one, right? So I, I think basically the I think it's easiest to maybe think about where it would come from in the context of the threshold algorithm. So in the threshold algorithm, what we really need is to find some set of orange points that kind of hits every quantile of the distribution, and one way you could imagine doing this, which I maybe wouldn't recommend, is you could, you know, sort of just declare that some small sample of people are going to give, um, make their data public. But for example, you might imagine that, um, you know, suppose we were studying, we collected data for, say, the census, and we have data from, you know, the last decennial census, which is not exactly the same distribution, but maybe it's good enough that we see one representative from each quantile. And maybe that data has already been made public and we, you know, we can't take it back. And so we might as well get to use it. Not, you know, not only the attackers should get to use it, we should get to use it. Um, you could also just, you know, you might just know that, right? You might just say, I don't exactly know how, but I've studied this problem and I just sort of know one good representative from each quantile um, but it's not, it, 
in the sense of can they be synthetic? Yeah, they don't have to correspond to real individuals. What's important is that you can get some kind of representatives for the distribution. And one way you could get that is by taking a small number of samples from the data for which you're not going to protect privacy. But I think any given application, I mean, we, our paper I would say is motivated by applications, but in the paper we just say, for some reason you get samples from the distribution that don't require privacy. I hope that answers your question. I have a really quick follow-up sure. question. For example, does this mean that you could use part of your privacy budget to train a like um, synthetic data generation algorithm, use that to create public points and then feed those into, into this algorithm? Possibly, that may be something that Stephen and uh, Thomas and I and some students have been thinking about. <laughs> Good to know. Good to maybe know. Okay. For, maybe for next, uh, maybe for TPDP 2021, we'll <laughs> explain how to do that. Yeah, it will um, be in TPDP 21. Okay, Stephen confirms it will be in TPDP 2021. Very confident, Stephen. I like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I, I think you're raising a good point, which is that we sort of motivated the work by what you can do with public data. But I think really it should maybe be thought of as what kinds of background knowledge do you need in order to um, make private algorithms more accurate or more efficient? Um, yeah. And there's sort of a lot of places you could imagine getting that. Awesome, thanks. Right. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, thanks for the good questions. Yeah, of course. Thank you, John. Thanks.